Hello everyone. This is another video in my series on computer systems. In this video, we'll be taking a look at part three of module two. We're still talking about machine code and we've talked about some basics and we've talked about control flow. So we've talked about how do we do conditionals in machine code? How do we do loops in machine code? But something else that we do all the time are we call procedures. Right? We see these function calls all over the place whenever we code. So let's take a look in this video at how we deal with those things in machine code. Now, there are several mechanisms that we have to deal with when we talk about calling a procedure and we pass control. Right? So we go from wherever we make the call, we have to jump over to the beginning of the procedure code. And then eventually, once we've executed that, whatever's in that function, whatever's in that procedure that we call, we have to get back, right? We have to return. We have to go back to where we called it from. So we have to figure out a mechanism for that. We have to pass data. When we call a function, a lot of cases, we pass procedure arguments to the function and we get return values back. We have to deal with memory management. We have to allocate some memory during execution and we have to return back to where we called it from eventually. So we have to deallocate the memory when we do that. Now, these mechanisms are all implemented with machine instructions and x86-64, for example, uses only the mechanisms that are required, right? We, we always keep thinking in terms of saving those clock cycles and keeping things simple when we get down into the machine code level of things. So x86-64 is only going to do what it has to do to make all of that happen. But before we dive into any examples, let's talk a little bit about the x86-64 stack. All right, we've all heard about this term before. We've heard about the procedure stack. Now, this is a region of memory that's managed with stack discipline and the thing we want to keep in mind uh the thing we want and it's a little in uh, counterintuitive so we want to be careful about this is that when we look at this region of memory that's that's kind of set aside for the stack the highest address is the bottom of the stack the stack actually grows down in memory it grows toward lower addresses so we kind of have to remember that, that we almost have to flip things around from what we might intuitively think. So again, the highest address is the bottom of the stack. And then as we add things and we grow the stack, we will talk about the top of the stack is actually at the lowest allocated address. If we wanted to go to you know, add something, we want to push something onto the stack, and we'll talk about more about push in the next slide, but we're going to make the stack bigger. We're going to expand things. We're going to put something at the top of the stack. That means we go to a lower address, right? So we keep that in mind. I wanted to go into that. So you pause and really think about that and try to remember that, that that stack grows downward. So the top of the stack, as the stack gets bigger, the top of the stack is going to be at lower and lower addresses. Uh, now, Remember we talked uh, in both of the previous videos in this module about the register RSP, the stack pointer. And here's where we talk about what it specifically does. That contains the lowest stack address. And because it's the lowest address that's been allocated to the stack, we're talking about the address of the top element of the stack. So the RSP just always points at the top of the stack which again is the lowest memory that's currently allocated to the stack. So to illustrate that, let's take a look at a couple commands that we use to put things onto the stack and take things back off of the stack. First, we have push. Push grows the stack and puts whatever you've specified, whatever you're telling it to push, it puts that at the top of the stack. So it's going to fetch the operand that you're specifying. In this case, it's SRC, just source operand. Now, remember, we're going to grow the stack. And when we grow the stack, the stack grows down. So we have to go to a lower memory address. So we're going to decrement the stack pointer by eight. By decrementing it by eight, we go to the next word lower in memory, which grows the top of the stack. 
and then we're going to write the operand at the address given by the stack pointer. So once again, I know I kind of keep repeating this, but it's really important to remember because it's so easy to get confused. The stack grows down, so when we decrement our stack pointer, we're actually going higher in the stack, okay? We're getting more toward the top of the stack as we decrement the stack pointer. And to look at that from the other way around, we can look at pop. Pop is how we get something off the stack and store it at some destination. So in this example, we take a look at pop DEST, right? Destination. So this tells me I'm going to pop the top thing off the stack and I'm going to store it at whatever destination I specify. So this is going to read the value at the address given by the stack pointer. Notice that we don't pass pop or push. A, you know, an address on the stack to put it on. We are going to use the stack pointer every single time because we're always going to be dealing with whatever's on top of the stack. Because remember, with stacks, thinking just of it as just a data structure, with a stack, we can look at the top element, we can push something onto it, we can pop something off of it, but that's all we can do with a data structure known as a stack. Our function stack, our procedure stack, works the same way. So I'm going to read the value at address given by RSP. I'm going to increment my stack pointer by eight because I've popped something off the top. So I'm making my stack smaller. Remember, I increment to do that again because it grows down. That means when we shrink it, the it's going to the top of the stack is going to end up at higher and higher addresses as we shrink the stack. Uh, and then we'll store that value at the destination. And that destination, when we're dealing with machine code, when we pop something, we've got to store it into a register. We can't kind of skip a step and just pop something off the stack and put it out into a location in memory. We've got to pop something off the stack into a register. So let's take a look at some code. Uh, we've got a couple different procedures here. Uh, we've got both the C and the disassembled assembly code for both of them so that we can kind of dive in and see exactly what's going on. Now notice that the function mult store calls something called mult2, right? And that's the code that we see in the green boxes. So we've got two different functions and we're going to see what happens when we call one from the other and then return back to it. So the question is, how do we make that happen? And well, we're going to use the stack to support the procedure call and return. So we use the call command and we call some label, right? We're going to call the whatever the new procedure is called. And we're going to push our return address onto the stack and jump to that label. So we talked about jumps and we use that push command, right? We're gonna say, oh, okay, let's keep track of where we are. So I'm gonna look at what is the address of the next command that I want to execute, push that onto the stack and then jump to the label that shows me where the new procedure is. So that gives me my return address. Again, that's the address of the next instruction right after the call. And we'll take a look at an example of this. We're going to actually go through that example from the last slide step by step so you can see all this. So don't don't worry about going back and trying to map this to that code example. We'll do that in, in the next slides. And then when we return from the procedure, we use RET, just return command. That's going to pop that return address from the stack and then jump to that address. Before I jump over to that procedure, I'm going to store the address of the next instruction that I want to execute. Then I'll go jump to that procedure, do my thing. When it's time to return from that procedure, okay, I pop that return address back off the stack, go back to that one and continue on as though I never left. So let's take a look at how this all works using those functions that we looked at a couple slides ago, mult store and mult two. Now, first we'll take a look at just sort of the state of things when we get to that instruction, that call that we're going to use to go from mult store, when we call that mult2 procedure, right? At that moment, we have that call instruction lives at 400544. So that's where the instruction pointer is currently pointing. We haven't actually executed it yet. Uh, and that's going to specify that we're going to call mult2, which as we can see, lives at address 400550. And currently the stack pointer is pointing at 
hex 120. So it's pointing at address 120. That's where the current top of the stack is. So when we execute that call instruction, we're going to do a few different things. We're going to change the instruction pointer so that it goes to where MULT2 starts, right? That's, that's going to be the next instruction we're actually going to call is down there in MULT2. And again, that starts at 400550. So that's where the instruction pointer will point. We're going to push the return address onto the stack. So we decrement the stack by eight. That means that the stack pointer is now going to be pointing at hex 118. And just a brief note, keep in mind that we're using hex. That's what that little zero X means. So 120 minus eight is 118, right? We're dealing with hex and that's a base 16. So if we add eight to hex 118, we're going to get to 120. Anyway, we, what we push onto the stack is the return address. So that's going to be the address that we're going to pick up from, and that's 400549, right? It's the address after the call that we want to execute after this procedure returns. So that's where we are right after that call. We're going to start executing MULT2. Now, once we do that, we've gone through and we've worked our way through the MULT2 procedure, we're eventually going to get to our return that lives at 400557. So the instruction pointer is pointing there, which means we haven't executed it yet. That's the next thing we're going to execute. And when that happens, we're going to pop the return address off the stack and go back to 500549 because that's that return address that we pushed onto the stack before to pick up and continue execution. Once we do that, we've we've shrunk the stack, right? The stack pointer is now back pointing at hex 120. The instruction pointer gets the return address. So that ends up being the next instruction we execute. And as you can see, it's, it's just the next one. We've done our call. And in order to make sure that we have the proper control flow, we just pop that return, return address off the stack so that we know to go to 400549 for the next instruction we want to execute. But what about those arguments, right? In that C code, we saw that there were things being passed into the various functions. So why didn't we put any of that on the stack or did we? Well, let's take a look. Uh, we have our registers that hold our first six arguments, right? We we took a look at this back in the first video in this module. We've got our first six arguments going RDI, RSI, RDX, etc. by default. Our return value always just lives in RAX. Now, we can actually push those things onto the stack if we've got to hold on to that. If we need to preserve those values... We can push our return address. We can also push arguments onto the stack if we want to, but we're only going to allocate stack space for that when it's needed. So keep in mind, if we push stuff onto the stack, say after the return address, we have to pop it off before we can return, right? So we, we want to be careful about this. And again, we're only going to do that. We're only going to take up memory space if we have to. So did we do that? In that last example, well, let's take a look. Well, it turns out that we didn't allocate stack space for those things because we didn't need to, right? X and Y and Mult Store got stored in RDI and RSI, respectively. The address for destination is going to get stored in RDX, right? That's just standard. When we called Mult Store, those went into those standard registers. Now, when we call Mult 2, right, we give it longs a and b and those map to x and y so we we know where they are we know that now a as far as mult 2 is concerned a is in rdi b is in rsi so we can just operate on those like usual dump the result into rax and then when we return right we go back oh it's mult store knows that t is in rax and all mult store has to do now is write the value of t out to that destination address so we can do that with a simple move now we've got the result 
out at the location and memory where we want it, and we've taken care of all this, right? We've done our procedure calls. We've called. We've returned. We've gotten the result back out into memory where we want it. We just we didn't need to store anything on the stack other than the return address to do that, and so we didn't. Now, this is a good place to talk about some terms that we want to be familiar with moving forward. When we're dealing with stack-based languages, we're talking about languages that support recursion. That's C, Pascal, Java. Our code has to be what's called re-entrant, which means we can have multiple simultaneous instantiations of a single procedure. And when we think about recursive code, that's exactly what we do, right? We keep calling the same procedure over and over again with probably with different parameters passed into it until we, and so as they return back up that call chain of the recursion, we eventually end up with our correct answer. But as we call each instantiation of that procedure, we have to keep track of everything, right? We've got to keep track of those return addresses and everything else so that we can return back up that chain. So I need some place to store the state of each one of those instantiations. I have to know what the arguments are, I have to store local variables, and I have to store the return pointer for each instantiation. So to do this, we use stack discipline, right? We have a state for a given procedure, and it's needed for a limited time, right? Eventually, I'm going to return back from this procedure I called. So I have to be able to just keep track of that for as long as that procedure's running and until it returns, I got to keep track of everything. And keep in mind, the callee is going to return before the caller does, right? I'm not going to, we're not talking about multiprocessing here. We're not talking about different threads of execution at this stage of things. So we're going to assume that the callee has to return before the caller does because the caller, when it calls that procedure, is waiting for that return value before it can continue. Uh, now, the term that we use uh, is frames. Frame is the state for a single procedure instantiation, and so we're going to allocate frames onto the stack. All right, we're going to allocate space on the stack for each frame whenever we call a procedure, and that frame is where the state of that single procedure instantiation gets stored. So let's take a look at a few simple, uh, now, more ideas of functions than anything else. But these are functions that call each other and might call themselves. So we do have a procedure here called am I that is recursive. And we'll take a look at what happens on the stack. What do the frames do when you calls who, who calls two instantiations of am I, and am I, or at least one of the instantiations of am I, because am I, remember, is recursive, ends up calling two more instantiations of itself. So let's take a look in more depth at what the frames look like, and then we'll walk our way through this example. Now, when we call any procedure, we're going to allocate some things into the frame for that procedure. Now, the contents of each frame is going to include the return information. Now, that's that's got to be there. And if we need it, we can include some local storage and temporary space. But again, only if we have to. And in our molt store example, we didn't have to. So the frame for that molt too was just the return information. Uh, now, we've talked about the stack pointer. That is always points at the top of the stack. We can also, if we want to, this is optional, we can use the base pointer, RBP. And that points at the beginning of the frame. Right, so we can actually bracket the frame. We can know where a frame starts and where it ends by using the base pointer and the stack pointer. Now, to manage these, we just allocate space when we enter a procedure. This is called the setup code, and that includes the push by the call instruction. And that might be the only setup. Right? That might be the only thing we do is we grow the stack and do our push by the call instruction that could be it but we might do other stuff as well if we need to when we return that's called the finish code and that's where we deallocate so the finish code includes the pop by the return instruction so we'll start out after we've called you all right, we've got our base pointers set to the start of the frame that we have for you. Our stack pointer points at the top of the stack as always, which in this case, since you is the thing that we're executing right now, it's going to point at the 
last of the frame for you. Now, eventually, we're going to get to the point where we call that procedure called who. So we'll update our base pointer to point at the bottom of the who frame. We'll update our stack pointer after we put everything we need to when we called who onto the stack. We'll update our stack pointer to be pointing at the top of the stack, as always. And who starts running, and eventually it's going to call the first instance of am I. Well, am I does the same thing. That frame goes onto the stack after who. Update the base and the stack pointers. Now, eventually, am I, in this case, in this particular thread of execution, am I calls itself again, right? So we just have another frame. Now, that's a different frame, though. That is a frame for the second instance of am I. Now, eventually, if that one calls itself again, we'll have another frame for that instance of am I. So this is OK. This is exactly what we want. We have a, an individual frame for each specific instance of that of calls to the procedure am I. Now, eventually, once that last one gets done, it returns. So that stuff gets popped back off the stack. And now we've only got the two instances of am I on the stack. The next one finally returns. We're back to that original call to am I. That finishes up and returns. We pop that stuff off the stack. That goes back to now the top of the stack. We're looking at the frame for who. Now, who continues executing and eventually gets to its second call to am I. So that gets pushed onto the stack, right? We just get a frame for each particular instance of a call to a function. So again, when we see those multiple instances of am I, those multiple frames called am I, those are all for different instantiations of that procedure. Eventually, am I returns and we go back to just having the frame for who is what we're kind of looking at. When who gets done and returns, we pop all of that stuff back off the stack, reset the base pointer to point to the start of the frame for you. The stack pointer always, always, always points at the top of the stack and, and we're done. Right now, once you gets finished, that stuff's going to get popped off and we're back to the stack as it was before we called you. So now that we've looked at how frames get added to get pushed and popped to the stack, let's take a look at what happens when we need to store a little bit more than just the return address. To start with, let's take a look at this procedure called INCR or increment. All it's going to do is take a value that's living somewhere in memory at location P and we're going to increment it by some value. Then we're going to return the the value that was living at that location P. All right, so we just pass in a pointer P and a value into our procedure. And we can see the assembly for this is actually pretty simple, right? We're just going to move whatever lives at RDI because RDI, remember, gets our first argument. So that has P in it. So we go out to the memory location that P points to and move that into RAX, right? RAX is what we're going to return. So we've got X in our return register already. We'll just add RAX and RSI. Remember, RSI, when we called, got val. RSI gets our second argument, so that's val. And when we do this add, that becomes Y. So RSI starts out with val in it, then after we do this add, it turns into y. Then we'll take that value y and move it out to the location in memory pointed to by p, then we return, right? So very, very simple. This is actually just a, a little three, well, four, if you count the return, line a uh, bit of assembly that takes care of this procedure. Now here we see another procedure that calls the procedure from the last slide. All right, so in this one, we're just going to declare a couple longs. We'll have V1, which will just get a value. We'll have V2, and oh look, we're calling that procedure from the last slide. We're calling our increment procedure. So we'll give it the address that V1 is stored at, and then our val that we're going to increment that by is just gonna be 3,000. OK, and then we'll return V1 plus V2. But it's that call that we're interested in. So 
We have when we execute long V1 equals when we just assign, declare V1 and assign 15,213 to it. Our stack is doing what the stack does. We've got our return address at the stack pointer. Now, inside that assembly for call increment, we see how this is happening. First, we're going to actually allocate some more space on the stack. We're going to actually allow, we're going to grow the stack a little bit more. We're going to subtract 16 from the stack pointer and then put that into the stack pointer. So we're giving ourselves two additional words because remember we subtract because the stack grows down. So we've given ourselves a couple extra words and we're actually going to store the value for V1 into the first word after the return address. Okay, and that's how we use that displacement, right? So the return address plus eight gets us back one, right? We're diving back down into the stack because again, top of the stack is at the lowest memory. So we move that into the spot, the word that's after the return address. We're moving our value for V1 into there. The next thing that happens is that we're going to do our call, right? So we're going to move 3000 to ESI. That's we're just putting our increment value into uh, the ESI register. And then into RDI, we're going to drop the address that V1 lives at on the stack because we're doing this differently than in our last example where we only needed to deal with return addresses because our parameters don't map one to one anymore, right? Where call increment does not get parameters passed to it. So we're not just going to have the stuff already living in the right registers. We've got to store some stuff out to the stack, and then load them into the appropriate register so that when we call that increment procedure, we've got stuff there for it in the right places. Then we call increment. And what we've done there is we've set up the register so that when we call our increment procedure, it's got the right values in the right registers. So that increment procedure that we looked at before takes its input parameters. It adds that 3000 to whatever was living at that memory address, which was on the stack there. That's where it was RSP plus eight, right? Adds 3000 to that, stores it back out to that memory address. And we've reflected that here because we can see that RSP plus eight has changed from 15,213 to 18,213. That's what that increment procedure did for us. One more thing to keep in mind about that increment procedure that we just called, that just returned, was remember that that put the original value that was stored out there at that memory address into RAX. That's what it returned. So that means that that original 15,213 is sitting in RAX. So our next instructions in the call increment function that we're looking at here are just going to add what lives at that address, RSP plus eight, to RAX, which is that original 15,213 value, stores the result of that in RAX. Ah, there is our return value from call increment. That's our V1 plus V2. So now that's taken care of. Last thing we have to do is just finish things up. We've got to clean up things. So we grew the stack a little bit to store that value that we needed, right? We, we stored that as part of the frame for call increment. We've got to get rid of that. So we're going to add 16 to the RSP to shrink that back down, get rid of those extra words. And now we're po back pointing at the return address so that when call increment returns, we'll get back to the next instruction from whatever procedure called call increment. Now that we understand how that works, let's take a look at some conventions that we have to use when we're dealing with saving things in registers, because this is important. And let, let's start right out with an example to show a potential pitfall to, to using these registers without thinking about using some conventions to keep our data safe. 
So if we have you is the caller, so that calls at some point the function who. Now here's the problem with using a register for temporary storage. In this case, we just move the value 15,213 into RDX, then we call who. Now somewhere in the who procedure, we subtract 18,213 from RDX and store the result in RDX. Then when I come back to you after who returns, there's a command later on in you that adds RDX to RAX. Oh boy, wait, were we expecting the value of RDX to still be 15,213 or were we expecting it to be the result of this subtraction over in who? Uh oh, um, you know, and because of that, we have to deal with conventions. We have to do some coordination so that we know what we're expecting because otherwise you could be in error, right? We could be getting unexpected results by storing temporary information in registers, depending on whether we're assuming it's going to be the same thing in there or not. But we've got a couple different conventions that we're gonna see used. We've got caller saved, where the caller is responsible for saving temporary values into its frame before it calls another procedure. In the callee saved convention, the callee is responsible for saving temporary values in its frame before using registers, and then the callee will also be responsible of restoring them before returning to the caller. So in this case, we're, we're just gonna use those frames to save the state of our registers to make sure that various procedures don't kind of tromp on each other's stuff. And we can go right back to our registers and what they're used for. And back when we first gave you that table, that little graphic a couple sections ago that showed the registers and their uses, we saw that there were some that said caller saved and some that said callee saved. Now we understand what those are for. So for example, RAX, our return value, um, our argument registers, RDI through R9, and then R10 and R11 are also some temporary registers. They don't necessarily have specific uses like the other ones, but they're registers that we can use for various things. These are all caller saved. It's the caller's responsibility to take care of these things and they can be modified by procedures. Now, on the other side of the coin, we have our BX, our 12, 13, and 14, and the base pointer and stack pointers. These are callee saved. The callee has got to save and restore these, right? And especially, we got to be so careful with that stack pointer. That's a special form of callee save. It's restored to the original value upon exit from the procedure. We have to be super careful about that one because that is how our stack discipline works, right? Our stack pointers got to be pointing at the right spot or everything gets messed up. Because if we return and it's pointing to the wrong thing, then the calling function, the caller, is not going to have the stack pointer where it expects it to be. It's going to be doing its thing, assuming that the stack pointer is at a certain spot. When it tries to re return, it's going to be going to the wrong address. If it's just popping off some values that it's stored, it's going to be getting the wrong information, right? So that's one's very, very important. And all of these are important. We have to follow those conventions and make sure that the caller is taking responsibility for the registers that the caller is supposed to and that the callee is taking responsibility for the ones that it's supposed to. Now, let's take a look at an example where we're assuming that call increment two here, this procedure we're looking at, is the callee. This has been called from somewhere else. Okay, so remember that RBX and RSP our callee saved registers. So the first thing we're gonna have to do is save the state of those things. Or we're gonna have to make sure that we save the state or that we undo any changes that we do you know, along the way. So the first thing we do is push RBX up to the stack. We're gonna push it onto the stack frame because that is a callee saved register. So I've got to preserve the value that the caller thinks is in that register. 
Now notice in this second red line here, I'm subtracting 16 from the stack pointer. I'm growing the stack. And that means that when we're all done with everything, after we're done with the rest of this procedure, I'm going to have to shrink the stack back down. I gotta make sure that I undo any changes I did to the stack pointer. And I'm gonna go ahead and pop RBX, right? Because once I get rid of that extra space I allocated by growing the stack, the next thing is the value of RBX that I pushed onto the stack. So I pop that back off into RBX. Now, when I return back to whatever called call increment two, the stack pointer is where that is supposed to be. It's got the return address just like it's supposed to. And RBX has the same value as it did when the caller called call increment two. So that's just a quick example of this is what we have to do. If this procedure gets called, it's got to do some stuff to save the state and give the state of the registers back to the caller in the way that the caller expects. Finally, let's take a look at how a recursive function does things when we get down to the machine code. So here we just have a recursive version of pop count. This is just gonna count the number of set bits in an unsigned long that we, that we provide to it. And we're gonna do this in a recursive way. So let's take a look. First, we'll take a look at the terminal case. Okay, so the terminal case is just if x is equal to zero, then we return zero. And we take care of that right at the beginning. We move zero to EAX. That sets RAX to our return value. Because remember, when we move something into EAX, when we do a 32-bit operation, it's gonna zero out the upper order bits. So we've moved zero into RAX. Now, this one's weird, isn't it? We've got this test, and we're just doing test RDI and RDI. Um, well, gee, what, what's, what's the point of that? What's that doing for us? Well, think back to how test works. Test is like anding the two operands that we give it. So if we and RDI with itself, it's going to either set the zero flag if RDI is nothing but a bunch of zeros. If there's anything else, then it will not set the zero flag. And the next thing we do is jump if equal down to L6, which is basically where we're just the label we have for our return. So that's why that makes sense. I can test to see if X is zero because X is the only argument. So that's gone into RDI. So I and it with itself. If that's zero, then we'll just set the zero flag and jump if equal kicks off. We actually do a jump if equal based on what the zero flag state is. So jump if equal means jump if the zero flag is set. That's why that little snippet makes some sense. And this is a great example of something that I've mentioned in the last couple videos as well. Sometimes you, you really gotta think about things when you're looking at the machine code. You gotta think about exactly what a command is doing in order for the whole thing to make sense. So we do the test, we and RDI with itself. If it's zero, then okay, then we'll just jump down and return. There's our terminal case. Another bit of machine code weirdness here is notice down in L6, we've got that REP semicolon, then the ret, then the return. What the heck is that, right? What does that thing mean? Well, you'll see this because some AMD processors have had trouble when a jump is immediately followed by a return. Now what REP does, it just means repeat string operation actually. It just means you're going to repeat whatever operation you gave it until a certain condition is met, either with a count register or with the zero flag. Doing the REP, RET just does the return one time. You're not actually repeating anything, but putting that in there first fixes that issue with branch prediction in some AMD processors. So, Again, this is just kind of a weird thing 
that lands there and you just have to know what it does and what it's there for in order for it to make sense. So as you see that, you're going to see that. That's a pretty good indication that that was just dropped in there in the assembly because you've got a return immediately following a jump. So moving on from that, if we're not at the terminal case, now we have to do some stuff, right? We have to, to continue on and do some other things. So we're going to save the state of RBX. We're gonna push RBX out onto the stack into the frame for this particular call of this function, right? So remember, each instance of this recursive function gets its own stack frame. So we're going to save out the value of RBX and then we're gonna go ahead and move on through. We'll put RDI into RBX, we'll and that with one, we'll do a shift. Okay, we're gonna take care of the stuff that we have to do to do our return value and set up the parameter that we're gonna to pass to the next instance, the next time we call this recursive function again. And then we'll go ahead and do that call. So we call another instance of p count underscore r. Then after that returns, we're going to add rbx and rax. We're going to keep accumulating our total count. But then we've got to pop rbx back off the stack, right? We've got to restore the value of rbx before we then fall through and return from this instance that's the non, a non-terminal instance of this recursive function. So what we see when we deal with recursion is that it's handled really without special consideration. As far as the stack's concerned, this works the same way as any other bunch of stack frames. It means that each function has its own private storage, so it can save registers and local variables, saves a return pointer, uh, the register saving conventions prevent one function from corrupting another's data unless the C explicitly does it. And, and that's what we can run into with buffer overflow. Um, stack discipline follows that call return pattern. If P calls Q, then Q returns before P. It's a last in first out thing, just like the data structure stack, right? That's what it is. It is a stack. So it works in that last in first out way. So as far as that goes, it, it all ends up working the same. We can look at those recursive calls. They're all just discrete individual calls that get their own frames. So this is why that can all work. And this also works for mutual recursion. So if P calls Q and then Q calls P, et cetera, this same kind of thing will work. And it's because we have that stack discipline where we treat, treat every call just as its very own thing that gets its very own frame. So walking away from this video, keep in mind that, you know, the stack is the right data structure for a procedure call and return. Right, because P calls Q, then Q returns before P. That last in, first out approach works great for this, and so this is how why we use a stack. Um, recursion and even mutual recursion are handled by just the normal calling conventions. Right, we can safely store values in the local frame and call these saved registers. Put function arguments at the top of the stack. We return the result in RAX. That works just the same for recursive functions as it does for others. And the pointers are addresses of values and those pointer addresses, they can point to values that are on the stack or they can point out to global values. It, it doesn't matter, right? So that's the nice thing about this procedure control stuff is that it ends up being sort of simple but powerful because the same conventions work for recursion as, as for anything else.